I sat down and did the maths today and I realized that I have had a permanent altar, so an altar that is always kind of out and in use in my living space for about six and a half years now, which is quite a long time. So I decided to make a video and share my altar with you and talk about the symbolism of it and the different things that I use because I've never made a complete video giving you a full tour and explaining pretty much everything that's going on in the altar. I've talked about it at various stages uh, but I've never kind of given you that full all-encompassing picture. So I don't have a belief in sort of personal deity, uh, human-like gods and so on who require certain things of me in terms of practice or an altar. So I don't really think of my altar as being a shrine in that way. It's not set up the way that it is because I believe that there are kind of human-like or conscious gods wanting me to do it in that way. But it definitely is set up in a way to honor the way that I see cosmos as being sacred uh, and the symbolism and so on. And there's definitely nods towards divinity and uh, how I understand that to be and uh, the kind of symbolism and uh, often kind of human-like symbolism that I use to embody that. So I basically use my altar as a physical and symbolic reminder of the ways in which I find cosmos to be sacred and uh, I use the symbolism that is just most evocative of that for me. So it's there pretty much as a reminder to put me into a certain state of mind and to celebrate that in a kind of creative way that reflects me and reflects my own response to what I see as a divine universe. I use this altar every single day. I sit every morning here for meditation for about 20 or 30 minutes. And um, before I sit to meditation, I light the three candles that you may or may not be able to see, but I, you know, you will see throughout this video. And I say a very simple prayer. And um, that's it in terms of daily practice at the moment. Sometimes I'll do other things at the altar in the evenings. I may have other spiritual practices like going through prayer beads, uh, saying any other kinds of prayers or devotionals, um, or really any other kind of spiritual practice that I may be doing at that time. All of that happens for me at the altar. Uh, the only thing that happens outside of the altar that I think of as a spiritual practice is uh, tarot readings because I don't have enough space to lay out a whole tarot spread but I have been known to draw a card or two or three at the altar as well. I've also been known to journal at the altar usually after ritual. Uh, the main other time that I use my altar and this is where it really comes into its own is uh, kind of every six weeks or so uh, to celebrate uh, the eight pagan or earth-based festivals of the Wheel of the Year. And so at that time I sit at the altar and I do a kind of a more in-depth kind of ritual where I use more of the objects on the altar, I would say, and also kind of just pay more attention to the symbolism and, and that kind of comes into play a little bit more in what I'm doing as opposed to just when I'm sitting at it and using it as a kind of symbol or a, a kind of pictorial representation of the divine to kind of tap me into that feeling. So it becomes a little bit more practical at those times. So as I said, I do light all three of the main candles every single day before meditation with a short prayer. And these candles are really central to the altar. They are the main kind of working element of the altar. So the main kind of practical, physical thing that I actually do at the altar is really revolves around lighting of candles. That's always been something that's been central to my practice. I find it uh, just very, uh, emotive, I suppose, just the lighting of candles and saying certain words while lighting particular candles. So the main candle that I think of as being my main working candle is the kind of one of my main symbolic representations of the divine cosmos and specifically the, the central candle to me represents the unity of cosmos and uh, its kind of interconnectedness. The other two main candles are the dinner candles in the candle holders to the back of the altar, on the left, the far left and the far right. And these kind of represent a binary system that I like to use to understand the wholeness of the divine cosmos. So on the left hand side, this candle, it represents light and the creativity of cosmos, and then also kind of the uniqueness of all of its uh, diverse creations. 
and the items on this side kind of are symbolic representations to me of that. Uh, I won't go into all of them in too much detail, um, but I think uh, most of them have been gifted to me by friends and or things that I have picked up on beaches and um, at kind of emotive times and they are you know symbolic to me of uh, my worldview and uh, particularly relating to that kind of idea of creativity and uh, kind of the the kind of small scale of uh, individual persons individual parts of this kind of creative outburst of the universe. And then the candle on the right hand side, it represents the dark, it represents the destructive aspect of cosmos and um, how all of those disparate parts of the whole, those unique parts of the whole, how they all return to the void um, so that new things can be brought, brought about into creation. And uh, the symbolism on this side is very much associated with death and mystery and um, kind of death and mystery, the dark and the mystical are two things that really go hand in hand to me. I find that the feeling of awe and devotion is very much connected to love and light, but also kind of connected to even a slight feeling of fear or lack of full understanding. So that sense of, um, that sense of the occult and things that we can't quite grasp or understand. So that to me all comes under that category of uh, the dark and the destructive, not in a negative sense, but in its positive sense that it, um, yeah, that's a, it's a necessary part of uh, the creativity and the sacred creativity of cosmos. Uh, the main imagery on the altar, uh, this is the newest item that I've added to my altar in fairly recent times. And this is a print of an artwork by an artist called Audra Eau Claire and I will link her I will link her in the down bar I might even link a, a video somewhere um, in the tabby thing uh, so that you can find her YouTube channel and um, she is just one of my favorite artists I stumbled on her on YouTube I think actually through a tattoo video of her her tattoos uh, and then I discovered her artwork through that and I absolutely fell in love with it I just I love her style I love her her symbolism um, I just I love everything that she does and as soon as I saw this picture in particular it just it just screamed a uh, goddess to me so to me I actually tend to use the term god now to if I'm addressing the divine or to describe the divine because I like to have a kind of a name or a way to address the divine but um because god is kind of often associated in our culture with uh, the Abrahamic God and very male figure uh, for that reason and for many others I use feminine pronouns and I definitely like to have her represented through female imagery so just to counterbalance that use of the word God and that to me the combination of the female imagery and the word God with its sort of for me anyway Christian connotations because I was raised in a Christian environment um, and kind of balance with the with the feminine imagery and pronouns and that to me creates a quite a gender neutral kind of uh, divine that I can still address um, with personal pronouns and with human-like imagery uh, which makes the divine feel more close and personal to me and um, just more easy to access and uh, more easy to access within myself. So again this image that I have chosen by Audre Eau Claire to represent the divine is um, very much tying into that binary kind of creative destructive thing that I have going on really on the entire altar uh, like I say, as soon as I saw it, it just, it just worked to me. It just, um, for me, this is God. Uh, the kind of youthful, beautiful female face uh, at the front that is, um, for me, just speaks a lot about kind of fertility and creativity. Fertility, not necessarily in a kind of a women, woman being impregnated, kind of very uh, gender heteronormative kind of way, but in kind of the fertility of the land, of the earth, of, of cosmos kind of way. And then the face at the back very much speaks of this sort of destructive side, the darkness, the shadow, uh, the inevitability of decay and decline and also that kind of slight sinister edge of um, you know not everything in the world is always beautiful and easy and uh, that there is this kind of other side that is necessary to kind of counterbalance that light and creativity. 
So I'm only very briefly going to mention the box uh, at the center below this image uh, because to me this is kind of the heart of the mystery of my altar. Um, I use it in a couple of different ways uh, that I'm like I say not going to go into uh, but it represents like I say the kind of mystery of my faith of uh, my practice and, and so on and I'm always exploring new ways to use this as well in my practice. And then the crystal on top is just sort of um, a crystal that I have come to associate again, just with my, uh, with my spirituality in general and with uh, getting myself into that kind of spiritual headspace, I suppose. And there are two little kind of tea lights to either side. They're really just for lighting. They don't have any particular symbolic importance. And the crystals around again are really, I think these are some of the only things that are on the altar uh, really just because I like the way they look and they're not particularly symbolic. And then moving down further is my Tibetan singing bowl. This is um, a really wonderful piece that um, I'm really happy to have received as a gift. Uh, it was a birthday gift uh, that I purchased uh, with the person who bought it for me. Um, we kind of went shopping together on my birthday and uh, we bought it in a shop in Edinburgh, in a kind of witchy shop in Edinburgh. And we were told by the people working there, it was the only one of its kind. The rest of them were all these kind of, uh, looked like kind of factory made with the kind of um, images kind of stamped into them and that kind of thing. And this one just was very different. And I think I was, I was just looking for a particular, not a particular note or tone, but a particular kind of sound to the bowl. I didn't want it to be too high or too low. And this one just really gra grabbed my attention, especially because it, you could tell from looking at it that it has actually been kind of hand hammered. And they told us that this bowl actually came all the way from Tibet, uh, that they had uh, purchased a, a bunch of these bowls in Tibet at some point and uh, that all the rest of them had sold and this was the only one kind of remaining. So um, I feel very privileged to have this in my possession actually. Um, it, it just really, uh, I, I just love items like this that have a story. Um, but to me, sound and music and singing and that kind of thing is very important to me in my practice and um, really is one of the major ways that I get myself into kind of a spiritual mindset. And I often use this bowl to kind of set a sacred space. Uh, down at the front here around uh, the kind of main working candle, I have a couple of items that um, again are kind of more loosely symbolic, but, but still fitting in with this theme of creativity and destruction and kind of uh, the creation and then the decline. I have uh, an antler that my dad gave to me when I was very, very young. I'd say I was only four or five years old. He found it in a field somewhere while working. He's a geologist, so he spent a lot of time in the field when I was young, uh, the literal field. And uh, yeah, I've just always really loved it. And it's very symbolic to me of um, kind of creativity and, and the uniqueness of uh, different persons and creatures in the world, uh, but also the, the inevitability of change and decline and decay with the falling of the antler. But it is to me more representative of life than of death, because of course it would have fallen from a, a live animal who was you know, not dying or anything like that. Uh, which is why it's kind of made its way more to the left of the altar, whereas to the right, I now have um, a skull. This is another relatively new addition to the altar. Um, it's a deer skull that originated in, uh, in Scotland, uh, somewhere in the Highlands, I believe. It was purchased um, from an ethical Etsy user. Again, this was another gift. Quite a few, actually almost most of the items on the altar, the key items are gifts. Uh, this is another gift um, from the same person who bought me the singing bowl. Uh, and I, I absolutely love this. I love that I'm gonna have a little part of Scotland to bring home with me to Ireland. So this was a found item. This was, you know, um, a deer skull that was found out uh, in the wild somewhere uh, and uh, cleaned and, and resold by this Etsy seller. Um, I definitely would not be interested in, in purchasing skulls or anything like that, that had been procured in dubious ways or in any way related to factory farming or hunting or anything like that just not interested. Um, so yeah, so these two items are kind of key for me now in re representing the kind of life and death aspect um, and bringing in a little bit of the natural world, which I really, really love. And then I have uh, the fake flowers. It's kind of a fake rose uh, just to kind of bring that life 
kind of aspect back in again. Um, I would prefer to have real flowers, but realistically I don't buy flowers a lot, like uh, cut flowers a lot or anything. I do have some dried cut roses around and about the flat, but I find that they're very delicate when they're kind of dried. So the leaves, the petals tend to fall off them very easily. So I tend not to not really use them on the altar so much. And I like to just kind of have fake flowers to kind of represent again, the kind of uh, just the abundance of, of life and nature and that kind of thing. So another very major structuring element of the altar, even though it is quite subtle, is the circle of stones that kind of, it kind of brackets the two sides. It's not a perfect circle. It kind of goes into kind of bracket shapes on either side of the altar. I really, really wanted to have a physical representation of the wheel of the year on my altar when I was reconstructing it a couple of years ago. And what I came up with, I love it so much that I don't think I will ever have a permanent altar without this again. I realized that I had a lot of, I really, really love large, polished, but not spherical stones. They're my favorite kinds of crystals and stones. Um, I went through a phase of collecting quite a few of them. I don't really buy any anymore because I don't need any more at this stage, unless I saw something that I just, you know, couldn't say no to. Um, I've kind of, yeah, I feel like I've kind of fulfilled my need for different kinds of crystals and so on. But I realized that the ones that I had, I could pretty much assign each of them and I associated them with different times on the wheel of the year. So um, it starts on the kind of left hand back corner and um, with a stone for a mulk in February. And then it kind of goes counterclockwise uh, all the way around to the midwinter on the right hand side. So I won't go into each individual stone and why they, I associate them with that particular festival, uh, but they all do have, some of them it's more to do with the color that I might associate um, a particular color with a particular time of year, like the color purple, for example. Um, I have the color purple associated with Lunasa because that's a time of year when there are a lot of purple flowers in our garden and that kind of thing. So it can be quite uh, simple um, and also can be more profound. I have a stone, the only kind of uh, stone as opposed to a more kind of crystal, human polished stone um, was uh, another gift to me from my father. I believe there were like three or four objects on the altar that were gifted to me by my father. Uh, and he gave that to me uh, on Bialtana one year and uh, so to me, it will always be representative of Bialtana and it reminds me of the sea because he found it on a beach and it's just such a beautiful stone. So yeah, I really like having that representation on the altar. And again, it's split between the light half and the dark half of the year. To me, the light half of the year starts at Imolk because that for us in Ireland is when spring begins. And uh, then the dark half starts at Lunasa uh, in August because that's when autumn begins. And that kind of, to me, makes the most sense on each side. And it's counterclockwise just because that's, I, I just intuitively do everything counterclockwise. Uh, can't really explain it. It's just how I see things. And when I think of the year moving, I think of it going counterclockwise. So there's no particular reason for that. It just makes intuitive sense to me. And then last but not least, I have uh, another quite practical uh, item or two items on the altar. Um, this used to be, I used to have a slightly different two items. I used to have an oil burner and uh, a like kind of a glass vial with water in it. So I would use the water and then put some oils in and, and burn some oils. Um, but I decided I wanted to get back into burning herbs and that's what I use. It is actually an oil burner, um, but I find that using the oil burner and then I put, I put a, a kind of tray of tin foil in, I have it out at the moment because I've kind of uh, destroyed it somewhat through burning a lot of paper in there and it's kind of blackened and stuff. So I need to kind of clean it out and put it back in. Uh, but I use this kind of tin foil tray to light the candle underneath with the tin foil on top and I can burn herbs in there and they do actually burn but they just don't burn as quickly. Um, there's less smoke. Um, it's just a little bit of a less intense way uh, to burn incense and herbs um, rather than the full kind of charcoal disc, which is really quite an intense uh, incense burning experience. So I've done that here, particularly because I have uh, a smoke alarm and I just don't want to set it off. So um, I find it a helpful way of doing that. So um, yeah, and then the dish on the left hand side is nothing particularly special about the dish. It's just a soapstone bowl that I bought on an online pagan site. And I use that to store whatever incense it is that I'm working with. So yeah, I think that wraps it all up. And I, I was a little bit on the fence about making this video because it's quite a personal thing to share everything in so much detail about what's on my altar. And like I say, you know, you'll notice that I haven't gone into full detail on everything. And to me, that often kind of 
mitigates the sense of vulnerability of sharing something like this online is holding something back a little bit, keeping something private. Yeah, to me, because this is out and visible in my room, um, I've gotten less touchy about people seeing it over time. I made a video uh, quite a lot of years ago now, maybe five years ago, about having an altar out in my living space and talking about that and my experience of that and how I would kind of feel uncertain about having people over sometimes or like I might even pack the altar away if I was having a party. Uh, and I think I've changed since then. I think I feel less reticent about people seeing it because I just feel like I'm I'm no longer wanting to hide away that part of myself to people who meet me. I'm not interested in segregating that away from my everyday life. So there you go. Um, that's all of my altar and what what's on it and why it's there and all the meaning attached to it. I hope that this was interesting and um, I'd love to see videos of your altar spaces or even just pictures of your altar spaces or to hear about them. I'm not sure what the best way is for you to let me know if you do that because I feel like the YouTube comment section isn't going to be particularly great for letting you link videos or images or anything without flagging them for spam. But, um, but yeah, if you do make a video, let me know and uh, maybe kind of attach a, a picture. If I share this on Facebook, you could attach a picture in the Facebook comments or tag me on Instagram. Maybe if you want to share a picture on there, um, I'm Anya Orga, A-I-N-E-O-R-G-A on Instagram as well. So uh, yeah, thanks very much for watching. Thanks for taking an interest. Um, I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will talk to you all again soon.